Hi, this is Alma, and I'm here to give you an introduction about spatial decomposition methods, a topic that I've been working quite extensively on and that I think is super interesting. So here we go. So my very first idea here was to just give you a very sort of like simplified image here of what these spatial decomposition methods actually do. So the basic idea here is that you take single cell data and spatial transcriptomics data, you combine or integrate the two in order for you to be able to spatially map each cell type found in the single cell data down onto your spatial data. And now you might ask yourself or more appropriately me, why do you have to use this single cell data when we have the spatial data? Can't we just look at, for example, how certain marker genes are distributed within our spatial data and try to figure out how these cell types are spatially distributed without having to rely on a different data modality? And that's a really good question. And in order to understand this, we need to just have a look at how this spatial data actually is designed or constructed. And in most of these capture-based spatial transcriptomic methods like Visium or SlideSeq or ST, we actually don't have single cell resolution, meaning that each spot, and I will be referring to capture locations here as spots, just for the sake of simplicity. Each spot is actually a mixture of multiple cells, not all necessarily from the same cell type. Of course, the cells at a single spot could all be of the same cell type as with spot number two here, but that's not a guarantee by any means. And usually we have this mixture of multiple different cells from multiple different cell types. And just as our spots are a combination of cells from different cell types, our observed gene expression profiles would also then be a mixture of the gene expression profiles from different cell types. But all that we actually see in our spatial data is this mixed gene expression profile while what we're actually interested in is sort of like this abundance of each cell type at each of our different spatial locations. And this means that our objective somehow becomes to decompose the gene expression data, meaning that we want to be able to go from the observed gene expression levels to be able to make an informed statement regarding the cell type population in each and every one of our spots. And I just want to be very clear here that these methods or these issues or like this objective, it's only relevant for spatial transcriptomics data with mixed profiles, uh, meaning that they don't have single cell resolution. And such methods or such sort of like spatial transcriptomics data types are Visium, SlideSeq version 1 and version 2, and ST. For high-res spatial methods like MERFISH or SeekFish or AwesomeFish or even ISS, we are usually more interested in label transfer rather than decomposing of the gene expression values. So just to give you an analogy in case this didn't quite resonate with you or if you're new to this kind of data and just need a bit of time to digest it, I'm going to try to cast it in a slightly different uh, phrasing here. Okay, so imagine we're composing a drink here and at our disposal we have three different drink mixers. Drink mixer A, B and C. And they are actually quite similar because they all use the same ingredients, sugar, caffeine and citrate. But what sets them apart is the ratio of these different ingredients. And so now we take some from each of these mixtures and pour it into a glass and we blend it together and end up with this mixture in the bottom here, which has a new profile of these different ingredients, some sugar, some caffeine and some citrate. A decomposition task in this context would be like saying to someone, okay, you have these three drink mixers here and they have the following amounts of each ingredient. And also here you have the final mixture and you know how much of each ingredient is in this mixture. Now tell me approximately how much of each drink mixer that was used in order to render this final mixture. So how does this relate to cell types and cell type mapping? Well, imagine that instead of drink mixtures, we have different cell types and we know approximately how much of each gene that each cell type tend to express. And rather than having a mixed drink, we have a mixed spot with transcripts from the same genes, but donated from different sources. And what we're seeking here is now sort of like this latent state telling us how much of each cell type that is actually present at this spot. Now, there's one really big difference here, though, between the analogy that I just presented and the real sort of like situation that we're actually operating within. And that is that cells are sadly not standardized like drink mixtures. And actually, there is quite a lot of variance between cells from the same cell type. Of course, if we have two populations of B cells and T cells, respectively, 
the cells within the B cell population will be more similar to each other compared to the cells within the T cell population and vice versa. But there will still be some differences be between the cells within the same population. And that's sort of like why it's quite inappropriate for us to treat the cell's gene expression as a static feature. We should rather think of the gene expression or the gene counts as samples from a statistical distribution to model and account for this variance and uncertainty in our data. And that's what we tried to do in this method that I was the main developer of called Stereoscope. And my idea here was to very briefly introduce you to sort of like the mechanism and workhouse of Stereoscope. Uh, just to sort of like provide you some insight into how one of these methods for spatial decomposition could work and then to go through some other alternative methods as well. So essentially what we're trying to do here with Stereoscope is that we're applying a three-step method where we start off by inferring cell type specific expression parameters for the single cell data. And essentially this means that we're trying to characterize and learn the statistical distribution that describes the gene expression for each cell type within our single cell data. We then use these inferred parameters to find the optimal combination of each cell type within each spot that best would explain the observed gene expression values. And finding this optimal combination is more or less equivalent to finding the correct proportion values of each cell type within each spot. And then once we have these proportion values, since we know where each of our locations are spatially located, we can simply then visualize the proportion values and we get these spatial maps of the cell type distributions within our spatial data. And of course, it is slightly more complex than adding just bar graphs together. It's all built around this probabilistic model where we use a negative binomial distribution to characterize both the single cell and spatial transcriptomics data. And uh, I chose to use the PyTorch framework for the optimization parts. The implementation is available at GitHub, uh, at my GitHub page, and it's called Stereoscope, as I said. There's also an implementation in the SCVI toolbox, sort of, not made by me, but by the really super, super skilled authors there. And to the right here, you can sort of like see this statistical model that underlies this whole method, but I'm not really gonna go into the details of this right now. All right then, just to say something about the kind of data that you need in order to run stereoscope and methods alike, and as well as what sort of output that you will receive, um, I tend to say that you need three things in order to run stereoscope at least. And that is a spatial count matrix telling you how much of each gene that is expressed at every spot. A very similar single cell count matrix telling you how much of each gene that is expressed within each cell. And finally associated with the single cell data or the single cell count matrix, you will have uh, metadata where you have cell type annotations telling you which cell type that each cell belongs to. And if you have all of these three elements, you can take them and run them through stereoscope. And after a while, it would spit out this proportion matrix telling you how much of each cell type in a proportion value that is present at each spot. And just to give you a feeling of what the data could look like, for example, if we look at the spatial count matrix, we see how we here have spots along one dimension and genes along the other dimension. And each element tells us how much of that specific gene we have present at that specific spot. And the single cell data count matrix looks very similar, but instead of spots, we have cells, meaning that the elements here tells us how much of each gene that is expressed in each cell. The metadata will have the same cells as the single cell data, but it will have a column also telling us which cell type that this cell specifically belongs to. And now for the proportion matrix or the spatial proportion matrix, uh, we will see how we have spots along one dimension and types along the other dimension. And each value here tells us how much uh, or like the proportion of cells that belongs to a specific cell type at that specific spot. Now, even though it's not a requirement or a necessity, I would highly recommend you to use a GPU resource because that drastically decreases the time it takes for a stereoscope to run and gives you a way faster analysis. So if you just take this proportion matrix and have a look at what it actually looks like when we visualize it, you can see here in this image, uh, actually two things. In the inner circle, we have single cell data from the mouse brain, and this is a GTSNE embedding, very similar to a TSNE embedding, more or less equivalent, so you can just forget about this G part there. 
Uh, and here you see the data points colored by the cluster identity. And in the outer circle, you see Visium data from the mouse brain. It is from the same region as the single cell data, but it's from a completely different specimen and a very different study. It's from 10x website actually, so this is public data, while the single cell data comes from a different source. And in this outer circle in the Visium data, the face color intensity of our markers indicates the proportion value of each cluster here. So you can sort of like see how the different clusters found in the single cell data are spatially distributed in the spatial transcriptomics data. And that is the whole objective, of course, of our usage of these spatial decomposition methods. Uh, so to speak a bit about other methods then, uh, because a stereoscope is by far not the only method, I'm not even claiming it to be the best method, uh, that's up to you to make up your mind about. Uh, but I wanted to sort of like just mention some other methods here. And there's a plethora of different methods and I couldn't possibly go through all of them. So I'm just going to give some examples here. So take this as a non-exhaustive list of methods. And uh, I've also tried to categorize them slightly into different groups, just to sort of like make some sort of distinction here. But this is again is something that you can fiddle quite a lot with and sort of like put different group uh, methods together or not. Uh, but this is something that makes sense to me at least. So we can start off by looking at these marker gene based methods. And what is typical here is that we tend to extract marker genes for each cell type from the single cell data and then compute some form of enrichment score for each set of marker genes in the spatial locations within our spatial data. We then sort of like normalize uh, these sort of like enrichment scores to make them sum to one, and we have some sort of pseudo proportion value. Uh, and that sort of like gives us an idea of how the different cell types supposedly are distributed within our spatial data. We then have the anchor based methods, uh, and that is sort of like mainly CRAT that's using this. Uh, where we try to find anchors between the different modalities using, for example, mutual nearest neighbor uh, graphs. And we then sort of like create this correction vector based on the differences in the expression. And we can use these correction vectors to remove platform effects and we end up with an integrated data set, which then allows us to transfer labels from the single cells to the spatial data points. Uh, we also then have this set of probabilistic modeling based methods where we assume that the gene expression follows a certain statistical distribution and we try to jointly model the single cell and spatial data and also then learn the cell type parameters from the single cell data to then use these to deconvolve or decompose the spatial data. And we also then usually try to somehow model for eventual platform effects and examples of methods that uh, sort of like uh, employs this strategy uh, is stereoscope, uh, RCTD and cell to location. And uh, finally, we have the reconstruction based methods. And these methods, they do not learn general characteristics of the cell types uh, to then use these characteristics in some sort of joint model where they infer the cell type proportions as is in the probabilistic modeling based methods. Instead, they try to reconstruct the spatial gene expression by rearranging cells from the single cell data in a spatial manner. So essentially what's going on here is that they look at each cell in the single cell data and say or asks the question, where in the spatial data do you best fit in? And then once they have positioned all of the single cells uh, in the spatial data, they can see how many cells of each cell type that are present at each spatial location and they can get or infer a proportion value. I also want to say something about these reference-free methods that you might or might not have heard about. And in order to put these into some sort of context, I also want to present a bit of a brief history about these spatial decomposition methods. So you can imagine here back in 2018 when uh, this precursor to Visium ST had been around for approximately two years and more spatial transcriptomics data had started to be generated. Uh, people started to realize that these standard decomposition methods like LDA or matrix factorization and so forth, they were great at decomposing the data, but they tended to generate factors that didn't quite represent cell types, but rather certain tissue regions or uh, a specific mixture or ratio of different cell types or just expression programs in general. 
And what people really were interested in was to see how the different cell types were specifically organized in their tissues. So people started to request something else, some set of new tools that would allow us to achieve this objective. And in 2019, or maybe even a bit earlier, uh, people started to realize that single cell data could be used to guide this decomposition. Meaning that even though cell types are indeed unobserved in the spatial data, they are very much present and observed in the single cell data, and that could lend itself to the sort of like guided decomposition. So in between 2019 and 2021, we started to see this surge of spatial decomposition methods that used single cell data to guide this decomposition. And just to give you sort of like some sort of insight into this, I've compiled this timeline here, which lists how different methods were released in chronological order. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of them, and this list is by no means exhaustive. And of course, people didn't just stop developing methods like this, uh, after 2021, but this trend continues. But I think sort of like between 2019 and 2021 was also like the peak surge in these methods. And all of these using the single cell data to guide the, the decomposition can be referred to as guided or reference-based spatial decomposition methods. Now, what's quite funny here is that in 2022, people started to make this sort of like claim or argument that it's quite annoying to have to rely on a single cell reference data set for the spatial decomposition. And they said sort of like, why not learn the cell types from the data using, for example, LDA or matrix factorization instead of using this external single cell data set? Which is quite funny to me because this is very similar to sort of like the problem that we tried to circumvent or, ad or address by using these guided decomposition methods. Mm. However, these methods are usually what we refer to as unguided or reference-free spatial decomposition methods. And one such example is ST deconvolved by Miller et al. And now uh, it's pretty nice not to have to rely on a single cell reference, of course. Uh, ideally, we would just work with our spatial transcriptomics data set. But as I mentioned, there are certain caveats to working with these uh, unguided factorization models. And that's something that's been shown when we made certain comparisons as well. For example, if we look at this uh, publication called a comprehensive comparison on cell type composition inference for spatial transcriptomics data, which was published in briefings in bioinformatics quite recently, they compare 10 different uh, spatial decomposition methods and they make some quite important or interesting statements here about uh, STD convolve, which is the one the, uh, method they use to represent these reference free methods. And they say here that STD convolve as the only reference-free method in our evaluation shows rather unstable performance across tissue. Uh, they also say that uh, we still need to annotate the clusters or factors inferred by STD convolve on their corresponding cell types, meaning that even though you have this sort of like unguided decomposition where you don't need a single cell data set for the actual decomposition, once you obtain your factors or clusters or programs or whatever you choose to call them after the decomposition, you need to look through these and try to annotate them as a specific cell type or whatever they represent. And they also say here in their sort of like uh, conclusive remarks or something, uh, in summary, our CTD and stereoscope exhibit consistently high performance across tissues. So this is a bit of a shameless plug for me, I guess. But more importantly, they say that STD convolve as the only reference free method, again, has the capability of, for identifying tissue structure and cell mixture, but cell type mapping must be addressed carefully. And I think from these sort of like publications, there is uh, or there are a set of really important take home messages. And that is that in the reference free methods, you still have to decide on the number of cell types that you want to decompose your data into or try to decompose your data into. And remember, that doesn't always work out. Actually, sometimes you don't end up with a factor that represents a cell type, but rather use some form of tissue composition or something. And once you have your factors, you need to annotate them, you need to look through the associated genes or whatever you have uh, that sort of like describes these factors and try to figure out what they represent. And currently, guided decomposition methods tend to perform better than the reference-free methods. That's sort of like what all of these sort of like comparisons show. Uh, however, if you want if you don't have single cell data at your disposal, the reference-free methods are the best or like the only option that you can use. And I think they are an excellent option then. But uh, if you have single cell data available, I would recommend you to always use a guided decomposition method.
So to summarize, we use decomposition methods when there are more than one source or cell contributing to our observable data, that is the gene expression in our different spatial locations. And most decomposition methods require that you have spatial data, single cell data, and finally single cell data annotations telling you which cell type each cell belongs to. And there are plenty of decomposition methods. Uh, some popular ones are, and these are by no means the only ones, uh, stereoscope, Tangram, cell to location, and RCTD. And all of these have shown to perform at a quite high standard. So you can pick whichever one you think performs best on your data. It can vary a bit because they have different modeling assumptions and so forth. And decomposition methods go by many different names. A very popular one is sort of like these deconvolution methods. Uh, some people call them integration methods, some call them projection methods, etc. But these are all just like different names for the same objective. Uh, and guided decomposition is when you have a single cell reference that guides your decomposition. And these methods usually, at this moment of time, tend to outperform reference-free methods. So with that being said, I just want to say thank you so much for listening. I hope this was informative and that you've at least learned something. If you're curious about what I'm up to, I do have a Twitter account that I tend to update semi-frequently. I've been a bit more relaxed about that over the summer, but I'll be back to posting now this autumn. And I also have a webpage slash blog where I do some blog posts every now and then. Again, thank you and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the course.